Again, welcome everybody. It's Dr. Myers coming to you from my home office. So just like last week, I'm going to go through the slides. So those are available in the week two area here in the course shell under the lecture notes. You can download those and follow along. And also when you review the recording, you can skip to the slides that you have questions about or want to figure out what's going on. And just like last week, I'm going to go over what's due this week. So again, like last week, we're going to uh, do our two discussion threads. So start in the discussion boards. I'll go over those examples tonight and people are already posting up to the discussion threads. So again, once you post your thread, you can get feedback and see what people are posting to make sure you're on track for this week's, which is inferential statistics. So here's the discussion board, the discussion threads that people are working on. So I'm gonna go over some examples of those tonight. Then uh, the assignment again is for this week, same thing, there'll be some questions to answer, some problems to work on in StatCrunch. Um, so once you practice some discussion board, you can go ahead, work on your assignments. And then again, the quiz. And again, the quiz, just like last week, is just gonna be true, false, matching, multiple choice, open book. So make sure you've read through your chapters and read through the slides, particularly tonight's slides, before you take the quiz. So that's open book. And again, you won't be doing analyses for the quiz. You're just going to be doing uh, questions from the textbook and the slides for the quiz. So where did we end up? So last week, we did all this thing, this descriptive statistics, right? So that was kind of not so exciting. So hopefully tonight will be a little bit, little bit more exciting. But um, this idea of descriptive statistics is what we did last week. So we worked on bar plots, histograms, right? Box plots. We learned all about the mean, the mode, the variance, the standard deviation. We looked at standard scores. We looked at the normal curve. So all these things we use to describe our data set. We're gonna now use in our uh, next part of the course, which is the inferential statistics. We're gonna try to come up with, based upon our sampling, making some decisions on what's true in our data set. So to get there, we had to do all of that descriptive work, working with the measurements of variables, right? Nominal, ratio, interval, uh, ordinal. And so tonight I'm gonna to go through more examples of those because I know people are really getting this, but some people still aren't. So we'll do more examples. I'll try to stop talking again at some point and hop into StatCrunch and do some data analysis with you all. So to start with, that's where we left off. So when we think about inferential statistics and making decisions about stuff, so, for example, with the COVID-19 going on now, we're trying to figure out what drugs work effectively and what drugs don't. So we have to do some kind of test, some kind of control experimental group, look at the data to see what is really true in our data set. Does that drug really help people, right? So it's gonna be all this in, in inferential statistics. So to get there, we, we use in statistics, we use what's called the laws of probability. So I could teach a whole course in probability. I won't tonight. I'll try to keep it short because for this class, we don't need to be experts on probability. We just need to understand it. So probability as its basis, and if you read through chapter five, Dr. Polite talks about probability. We're really looking at the number of ways something can happen, right, divided by the possibilities. When we work with patients, they always ask us, right, what's my chances? I have this type of leukemia, if I do a bone marrow transplant, what are my chances? That's probability. We tell patients, well, for bone marrow transplants, it's 80 to 90% total cure, right? Well, what does that mean? It means out of 100 patients, right, 80 to 90 of them do really well. So that's what we tell patients. And of course, they don't hear the other 10 to 20% where things can go wrong but they're thinking of the positive end of probabilities. So we often express it as a proportion. And you can think of a coin flip, right? So if you have a coin that's even, you flip it heads or tails, 50-50 chance that you're gonna get heads, 50-50 chance you're gonna get tails. So when we look at probability, oftentimes mathematically, we think about it as a frequency theory, right? So another example, the weather you hear every day, right? The weather is, we're going to have a 50% chance of rain today. What does that mean? Well, under frequency theory, it means that 50 out of 100 times, given the barometric pressure, the temperature, the wind speed, the time of year, we see this weather event. So that's really a frequency theory where they're just doing the number of ways things can occur, rain or no rain, divided by the possibilities. 
So that's the basis of probabilities. And when we think about, let me hide this uh, meeting control here. When we think about probability, we think about it this way. Under the multiplicative law, things that are consecutive, we start to multiply. So we think about heads or tails 50%, right? Just flipping a coin. But what if we keep flipping the coin? What if we keep treating the patients and keep doing theories? What's that gonna get us to? Well, in probability, when you start doing consecutive events, you don't just add the probabilities, you multiply them. So Dr. Polite in chapter five goes through some of these examples, but just as example here, if it's flipping heads, 50% times 50%, you get 0.25. You multiply consecutive events. So basically there's a one in four chance of getting two heads in a row. So you don't actually add them, you multiply them when the events are consecutive. So if you look at page 86, this is a probability event. So the probability of getting heads the first toss, 50-50, right? There's our 0.25 and there's our uh, 0.125. So you can use this table if you're looking at how to get there. But as you see, as the consecutive events occur over and over, the probabilities get very, very low. And that's because we're multiplying them. And there's lots of ways to think about probability. How can we explain it? Well, we can think about things called a probability tree. So with a probability tree, you basically take the things that you have. So if you have a coin and you start flipping it, right? you get this idea of heads and tails. So if you take your coin, I'll hold it up to the camera here. Um, there's a whole Khan Academy channel on probability, right? You get heads or tails. So 50-50, right? And if you keep going, you flip the coin again, right? You're gonna get a heads or a tails. From the tails coin, you're gonna get a head or a tails. So if you start to follow the heads, you get what's called a probability tree. So now you can see that getting two, head, uh, two heads in a row, right, is really over here, it's one out of four events that you get. So that's really what a probability tree, I, I don't know, probability tree, trees make me a little crazy, but for some people they help if you're a visual learner, again, to make sense out of this kind of table from the textbook. So that's where we get our idea of probability trees from. You make a little tree and then you've got one out of four is going to be your probability when you multiply with consecutive events. So whether you think about frequency theory or probability trees, um, sometimes this confuses people. I'm more mathematical, so I just like to look at this. I can make sense out of this, right? 0.5 times that is 0.25, 0.25 times 0.25 is 0.125. Um, Whatever makes sense for you is a basis of probability. So the idea is with probability is you have different kinds of outcomes that happen, right? So let's go from coins where there's just two probabilities. Let's think about going to something where we've got a deck of cards, right? So deck of cards, we have 52 possibilities when you shuffle the cards. So now a 50-50 example would be drawing a red card right? Because there's, there's 26 red cards, 26 black cards, right? And you get a probability of 50%. So again, there's a 50-50 chance, 26 out of 52. When you pull a card from the deck, you're going to get a red card. So again, if you'd start multiplying them, same thing, right? The second time you draw to get a red card, if you replace 50-50 each time, again, 25% chance. So whether we use a lot of possibilities or a few, there's basic laws of probability of how we do stuff. And you can keep going. So in, in gambling, we, and we would call this just parlaying your bet, right? Keep the bet going. Can I get another red card? Can I get another red card? And you can see that over and over, as you keep going, the probability gets very, very low for getting a consecutive event. So this says that only one out of a thousand draws with 10 cards in a row, would you get all red cards, okay? So again, probability we could spend all night on. Let's give a practical example. Uh, whether you're a gambler or not, Texas Hold'em's become very popular. And here's a hand between Pepe. This is from the World Series of Poker, which is now, like everything is online now. So this was about four years ago. Pepe and, and Eric York were in a hand. So here's Eric and here's Pepe. She's a really great poker pro. You can see she's very determined here with her hat on and her stare. And the question here 
with probability with poker players do you think they rely on luck or probability what would be your guess for that well what uh, i do when i'm looking at this type of problem my friends are looking at the cards so here's texas hold'em we start with the community cards so those who don't play poker is basically you try to get right you try to get sets or you try to get three of a kind four of a kind right or you try to get a straight or a flush so all these possibilities are out there for poker. So it's like a chess game. You're thinking of all the different possibilities, all the different probabilities that could happen. So when I watch the World Series of Poker, maybe I'm the only one, I'm looking at the numbers, the percentages. I'm fascinated with how they calculate all of these different uh, per, uh, percentages. So if we look here, what? how did they get these things? So you see here, the first community cards are an eight, a three and a jack, and it's it's basically a rainbow draw, right? They're all different suits, so you're losing a lot of the flushes. They're far away in digits, so you're losing the straights, and all you're getting is really the pairs and three of a kind and four of a kind. So you can see at the beginning, Pepe starts out, she's got a pair of fours doing pretty well. She paired her fours, and she's in the lead by 72% to 28% over Adam York, who has an ace and a queen. Then we go to the next, frame of the TV, which I captured, and a five of spades came up. So again, Pepe is still ahead with her pair of four. She's got a small pair. And the question is, what are the possibilities? What are the percentages here? Well, the camera shows a pair of tens that were folded. And we've got four cards here, and we've got four cards here. So the first thing to figure out is who can type in first? Well, how many decks, how many cards are in a deck of cards? What's our, we'll do a little bit of math. It's like a calculator ready. How many cards are in a deck? Yeah, Courtney's got it, 52. So we start there with our 52. And we can see the pairs of the pair of tens were folded. We can see the ace queen because we've got the camera, the pair of fours, so there's six, right? And then we've got four more cards. So we've got a total of 42 cards left. Right, the pair of tens, we can see the fours. I'll hold it up to the camera here, right? So you said 52 minus our 10 that we can see, we've got 42 cards. So where are our tournament players? What cards left in the deck are, are gonna make Adam win? What does he need to get to beat her? There's no flushes, there's no straights, what's left? What cards are gonna make Adam York win? What does he need? And then we'll have to analyze the probability of that. Any poker players out there? Anyone? Bueller? What is what cards are going to make Adam win? She's got a pair of fours. What does he need to win? A queen, right? Yeah, a queen. Because a queen would pair the would pair his queen. So if this card, this is what we call, so uh, these are community cards, and you do a flop, and then you get the turn card, and the last one is is the river, right? A queen. Yeah, Kristen's got it. A queen would make Adam win, and also an ace, right? So the next question is, so there's no 10 here, no, there's a jack, so there's only one card left. It has to be an ace or a queen. How many, how many, who can type in first? How many queens are left in the deck? If we see one, how many queens are left to make Adam win? Three, yeah, Colleen's got it, three. And then, you know, the next question's going to be, how, how many aces are left? Yeah, three. So there's three queens, three aces. And believe it or not, Pepe, she's doing this math in her head. That's why she's concentrating. She's trying to figure out, based upon his betting habit, she knows that he's holding an ace queen or ace king, and she's still got him because she's got the, the cards that need to be there. So let's just calculate that, see if we can get the 14%. So you told me that the queens or the aces are going to make Adam win. So there are six cards. So of the 42 cards that are left, right, take six, get our calculator out, divide by 42, and that's where we get our 14% from. And of course, everything left is going to make Pepe win, because any other card, a jack, a six, a seven, it doesn't pair his ace queen, then she's going to win. So every other card that's left, then 14% minus 100 is the 80 six percent so she's concentrating because she's figured out by his betting that she's got an 80 86 percent chance of winning and she's pushing a lot of chips in there's eight hundred and thirty six thousand 
chips in the pot for this one. So it's a big pot. And then of course, guess what happens? He gets a queen, what we call this queen on the, on the river. And he looks pretty smug about it. See, he only had a 14% chance of winning, right? And he rivered, he rivered a queen. So in poker, this happens, right? Improbable events happen. Back to, to medicine, I mean, he won a lot of money, but back to medicine, we're asking ourselves, is this event real? It, I mean, we know improbable events happen. What are the percentages? And are, are we seeing, is that just his luck? Or is that something, is a phase of the moon? Is he really good at cards? Has he got some kind of power to draw queens out of the deck? We don't know. So this is the whole idea of probability. And for um, gamblers and for professional poker players, if you watch their backstory, many of them dropped out of uh, college as math majors, even from Columbia or Yale. They're all math majors. They're mathematicians. So Pepe was calculating that she was ahead. I mean, she lost, but through the hand, she, she knew she had a really good chance of winning. So she kept betting on this hand. And she just happened to be at the bad end of the luck. So that's really the basis of statistics. We want to see, can we make conclusions about our data using subject to chance? Is what we're seeing just a fluke? And how do we know it's just a queen on the river? How do we know it's just something that happened? So to do that, we have to use the laws of probability and graph them like we did in our distributions for week one in something called a probability distribution. So we analyze the probability of an event occurring using that distribution. So this is why we spent so much time on histograms and descriptive data last week. So we make a probability distribution and the total area of that distribution is one. And it looks like this. So if you look at cards, right, there's very few what we call face paint or big cards, jacks, queens, aces, kings, and the rest, right, two, three, four, five, six, seven, most cards, almost 70%, are these smaller cards. So that distribution looks like this, right? It's skewed to the right. So it has positive skew, it's skewed over to the right here. And so a lot of people who play blackjack, right? You're looking for the, the pain cards, the big cards, and seeing how many little cards are there. You're trying to count the cards while not looking like you're counting the cards because that's, you know, that's not legal. Gamblers do this all the time. They know the numbers, they know the percentages. And to get back at them, what does a house do? The house adds decks, more decks, more cards to the game. So it's all about probability and looking at these probability densities. So back to our example of IQ, you probably know that IQ centers around 100. And if we have, say we start sampling, we find a distribution. So if we take a bunch of children, and we can look at, so we can't measure all of them, but we sample them. And we see that the population mean for IQ is 100 right? If you're smarter, it's above 100. If you're not so smart, it's below 100. So that's our population value. We can describe it with our standard deviation, right? Which tells us how far away the spread of the data is, right? Because remember, that equation for standard deviation deals with the values and the average. So that's our standard deviation. And we look at that for something like IQ. We remember from last week when we talked about the normal curve, most of the values, right, are within two standard deviations of the average. So only about 2.3% of people are geniuses, really, really smart, and only about 2.3% are not really, really smart. Most of us are ending up in the middle here somewhere. So there's only about a 0.023 probability, because remember, that's a percentage. We, we do this out of 100. So, so the p-value is about very low, 0.023, of randomly selecting someone with an IQ of 130 or higher on this end of the scale. And then we get involved in something called sampling error. So once we sample the population, so say we start measuring people's IQ, like we could measure people's heart rate or cholesterol, and we sample 25 of them, is it gonna be exactly 100? Well, unlikely, right? We're probably gonna find some people a little bit smarter, maybe, it's a smart part of the country and people are smarter, right? Or there's always going to be some sampling error. So our average or our mean from our sample could be 98.2 or 101.6 or 99.7. So there's always some kind of sampling error when we start sampling, which we have to do, right? Because we can't measure everybody all the time on the planet. 
So that gives us, when we start to sample, we get a sampling distribution. And this is where we get into the theory of statistics. So if we were in a math class, we would be you know, looking at this for quite a while, but it's really just a sampling distribution. And it's a distribution, if we take it of the mean of an infinite number of samples for a given size, a sampling distribution is a theoretical, not an actual distribution of values. So we can keep sampling. And when we do that, we come to the most exciting principle of mathematics. So if you're at a party and someone's a mathematician, you can impress them by telling them you know about the central limit theorem. So wait for it, this is really exciting. Under the central limit theorem, it's a mathematical formulation that shows that the mean of a sampling distribution always equals the population mean if we keep sampling. What's really cool about the about the central limit theorem is the population values are, if the population values are normally distributed, so is the sampling dis distribution of the mean. But with large n's, if we keep sampling, the sampling distributions are normally distributed even when population values are not. So this is the whole key of statistics and mathematics. So it sort of looks like this. So say we have some fuzzy dice. And again, you can go in Khan Academy. He probably does a better example than I do. But if we just take this example, um, the dark background makes my eyes crazy. So well, let's just think about what this would look like. So if we keep sampling, let me grab a brush here. We have some weird dice, what we call funny dice. And the funny dice are funny because they do some weird stuff. They never get a two or a five. So when you roll them, you never see these two. You get one and six a lot. So just a six-sided die. And sometimes you get a three and a four. So if you start rolling the dice and we start to sample, that's what you see here. So as we start to sample, we can graph this. Six-sided die, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, and six. And just like last week, we're going to get a distribution. So each time you roll, what you see is we get a lot of ones and sixes in our distribution. We never get a two or a five, so these are empty, and sometimes we get a three and a four. So our distribution looks like this. And this looks nothing like a normal distribution, right? Looks nothing like that clippy bell-shaped curve. It, it's almost trimodal, right? It's got like three humps to it. So we never get a two or a five, we get a one and a six. So it looks like this and it's crazy. And how can you possibly get a normal distribution out of this or from, from working with it? Well, the key is, is by sampling. So if we keep sampling, so say our first sample, Again, we get a lot of ones and sixes, and sometimes we get a three. So like we learned last week, if you take the average, right, one plus one plus three plus six, and you divide by four, you get 2.75. So you can put these numbers in and you keep going. So what you do is when you sample, let me grab that brush again, something weird starts to happen. So keeping our numbers the same, and you just keep sampling. So for the first sample, you get 2.75. So there's our one, two, so we get a little bump here, right? We do it again, we get a three, a four, a three, and a one. We get another little bump. We keep sampling again, we get a one, one, six, and six. So that one's 3.5. And you just keep sampling and sampling. And as you sample, you start to get this type of result. Because even though the dice are funny, they start forming, if you keep sampling, this kind of distribution. And that becomes a normal distribution. Even though the initial one looked nothing like normal, if we keep sampling and we 
do something weird, we take the average. Even when the distribution is not normal, the average of those values will be a normal distribution. So it starts to look like this. We get this normal distribution out of a, something that looks nothing normal. And that's the central limit theorem, the most exciting mathematical theorem in mathematics. With large n's, if you keep sampling, the sampling distributions are normally distributed even when the population values aren't. And this allows us to do stats on data sets and to do theoretical distributions on things even though they're not normal. I, I can hear the awe, but um, that's as exciting as mathematics gets. So if we keep sampling, if we keep making this distribution, okay, we also get something called the standard error of the mean. And that's in the textbook. Let me go and grab that. So if you look at chapter five, we had the standard deviation. And as promised, now we're going to have the standard error of the mean and some weird looking distributions. Whoop, went right by it. So here's the standard error of the mean. It's the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. We can calculate these. We can calculate the standard deviation. And we know n because we know our sample size. So we can often calculate the standard error of the mean. And StatCrunch can do it for us too. It's based on this theoretical distribution. So we keep sampling. And the larger the standard error of the mean, the less likely it is that a sample means a good estimate. So we can estimate these standard errors of the mean. And the larger they are, the less accurate they are. But the smaller the standard error of the mean, the smaller the error. With the larger sample size, the smaller standard error of the mean because it becomes the more accurate the sample mean is likely to be. So one way to affect your standard error is just to increase your n because you're dividing by the square root of n. And that will make the standard of error of the mean smaller each time. So again, it's the sample standard deviation, right? The amount of variation or the spread of the data divided by the square root of the sample size. So for example, if we're trying to figure out our error in our sample of uh, children that we select, so we, we go out and sample 25 students, we keep sampling, keep sampling people and measure their IQ, we get an average of 101. We can determine the standard deviation, right? We covered that one last week based upon the, the N and the uh, average. Then you can estimate the standard error of the mean as 2.1. If we keep sampling, so say we sample 225 students, then it becomes smaller, only 0.7. So again, with a when we sample IQ, so we have an estimated population mean and a standard error of the mean in 2.1, we can construct a distribution around the mean to estimate the likelihood of obtaining that mean with a given range. And so we assume when we do that, that the scores are normally distributed. So we know how many standards of deviations we are above and below the mean. And the assumption is if we keep sampling according to the central limit theorem, we're going to have a normal curve to look at. So we do the same thing when we talk about probabilities. The probability is um, about 95% that all samples IQs from this population would be no more than two standard deviations below and two standard deviations above the mean. Because looking back at that normal curve, right, about 2.3% on either side, everything else is covered under the normal curve. With a sample uh, range, sample of 225, where standard error is 0.7, the range would be between 99.6 and 102.4. So again, the larger the sample size, the greater precision we have in estimating that population mean. So when we use this, and again, it's, it's becoming theoretical, we're looking at distributions in our data, and we're trying to estimate things, we do a couple different approaches when we try to find what these um, estimates would be and what these means would be. We can use hypothesis testing, or we can estimate with a parameter, like a confidence interval. So the hypothesis testing you probably heard about is where we say, oh, the, it's like a judicial system, right? We say we hypothesize that the defendant is innocent till proven guilty. And we do that with a hypothesis as much. In nursing, we use a lot of hypothesis testing. Uh, in the MD community, it, they go after parameters like confidence intervals, mathematicians like to do that but it's becoming blended. Both of them have 
clinical relevance, uh, relevance and used by both. So when we do a parameter estimation, we're doing an interval and a point estimate, trying to figure out what the average is in our theoretical distribution. And if we keep sampling, what our interval estimate's gonna be. So we calculate a single value that's a point estimate. Usually it's gonna be a descriptive statistic like a mean, an average. And the interval is gonna be our confidence intervals. And this is probably, I mean, if you've taken stats before, you probably heard of confidence intervals. You, we're going back into an election cycle, so you're seeing a lot of polling. And you hear, oh, the confidence interval, right, plus or minus four points. That's the confidence interval. It's the error or the estimation around constructing what the answers for the polls going to be. So a typical one we do is a 95% confidence interval, and that designates the range of which the parameter, what we're looking at, the average, where 95% has a 95% probability of lying. That means if we go back and sample people in the neighborhood, 95 times out of 100, we're gonna get this response. So it has a lower and upper limit, and they're typically 95% and 99% when or 99% when we report them. And the formula we can get from the textbook, and then we'll do some examples. So we find an average, a mean, we construct a theoretical distribution around it using the central limit theorem. And then we have a confidence interval, where it's the average plus or minus some number we get times the uh, standard error of the mean. It tells us 95% of those values are gonna lie around that estimate. For sample means, the appropriate theoretical distribution is the T distribution. You probably heard of student's T test and the T distribution. And I'll come back to this 1.9%, 1.96 in a minute. But as we keep going, we can look at the T distribution. That's on page 94. And it looks kind of funky, right? If this is the normal distribution, this, the blue here is the T. It's a little fatter on the sides. So for small samples, the tails of the T are a little bit fatter, but it's pretty close to the normal distribution. And this is what we call the T distribution. Again, a theoretical distribution. If we keep sampling, we get a normal like curve. And the T distribution looks like this. So it's 95% plus the, uh, is going to be the mean plus or minus T plus, times the standard error of the mean. So if we take our IQ example, where we had 225 children, our average was 101 for the IQ, our standard error of the mean is 0.7. The T coming from a theoretical table, that's coming from our theoretical distribution is 1.96, which is more accurate. So we take the 101 and plus or minus that T value times the standard error of the mean, and we get our 95% probability. So that means if we go back and we keep sampling, 95 out of 100 children will have an IQ, average IQ between 99.63 and 102.37. So just a confidence interval that we have. And I'll do some more examples of that in just a minute. So we can go around a average or a test statistic, or we can use hypothesis testing. So again, this is back to accepting or rejecting a null hypothesis, which you probably heard in the court system, right? If you watch court TV, we make a hypothesis that the defendant is innocent till proven guilty, right? And then we're gonna examine that hypothesis. With this type of approach, our null hypothesis is going to be a prediction that the variables in our analysis are not related. So we're gonna say that our null hypothesis would be nothing's going on, smoking doesn't cause lung cancer, it's unrelated lung cancer. So maybe people get lung cancer because of the phase of the moon or they go to the movies, right? It's unrelated. Uh, another one could be turning patients is unrelated to the incidence of pressure ulcers. So that's our null hypothesis. The other is called our alternative or research hypothesis. This is one we want to be true, right? That smoking is related to cancer, that turning patients is related to pressure ulcers. So we're always battling between these two, our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. And then we, we test with a certain logic. So it's like the criminal justice system, as I said. We assume the null hypothesis is true. So in statistics, we always start with the worst part, right? That nothing's going on. The drug's not gonna help COVID patients. Uh, people are not gonna get cancer. Nothing gonna, is gonna go on. And then we do a test to see from the sample data that the probability of the null being true or not. So we always base it 
base it on the null hypothesis. We, uh, we can't prove the alternative hypothesis. So I can't, I can't prove to you that smoking causes cancer. All I can do is prove or disprove the null hypothesis that it doesn't. So once we accept or reject that null hypothesis, then we can have evidence to accept the alternative hypothesis. And when we do that, there's always a risk of error, right? So in the court system, we, want it, we always say it's better, right, to let 10 people, 10 uh, guilty people go free than to convict one innocent person. We're always concerned about the risk of error with this kind of analysis. We have different types of error, type one and type two types of error. For example, if we use the jury decision, if the null hypothesis is correct, so the person really didn't do anything wrong, our null hypothesis is that they're innocent, and it's correct, we're happy. But if the null is correct, this would be a type two error, right? This would be a false negative. We didn't convict the person when they really did it. And a type one error is if the null hypothesis is incorrect, okay, so, and we reject it. So if the null is incorrect and the person really did commit the crime and the null is actually correct, that's a type one error. And if the null is incorrect, then we made the right decision. Right? We, got, we proved that that person really didn't do it. So these type of type one and type two errors have to deal with the, the type one is the false positive and the type two is a false negative. So again, the correct decision is when we have a true negative, when the null is really true and we uh, accept it, or if the null hypothesis is really false and the researcher rejects it, a true positive. For medicine and nursing and health science, we always want to watch out for these types of errors. So for a type one error, it's a false positive, right? So that's where the null hypothesis is really true, but the researcher rejects it. So an ineffective intervention is considered effective. That's a false positive. We decide, well, you, the patient may have cancer, but you really don't. So that's a type one, a false positive. For type two error, false negative is really bad in medicine because that's, we're saying a treatment is erroneously considered effect, ineffective. So a type two error is, hey, um, you actually do have cancer, but we missed it. That's a false negative, and that's a really bad outcome for medicine. So in healthcare, we often construct our studies in such a way that we have no false negatives, right? We don't want to let the guilty go free. Um, these type two errors, that no type two errors will be produced. And it will raise the risk of a false positive, but the rationale there, it's better to say, hey, we found something, let's test further than to tell a disease patient that, that you're fine, right? When in reality, they have a disease. So we can control these risks. The type one errors, these false positives, are controlled through our level of significance. So the probability accepted as a risk of a false positive. So in our statistics, it's the level of significance is the area of the theoretical probability distribution corresponding to a rejection of the null hypothesis. And in most cases, we set that false positive level at 5%. So we accept a 5% risk of a type one error, which is analogous to a 95% confidence interval. So if you look a little further in chapter five, this is what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be accepting or rejecting a null hypothesis. And what we do is for that is on page 105, we're going to do this. We have to decide what, to, what test statistic to use. And I'll go through some of those tonight. We establish the significance, determine whether to use a one or two tailed test. We're going to calculate that statistic or let the software do it for us. Determine the degrees of freedom, compare it to a tabled value. And then we decide to accept or reject based upon the absolute value of the test statistic being greater than the tabled value. So when we talk about significance in statistics, this isn't an English class. Uh, really, all it means is the results we see are not attributable to chance. Doesn't mean it's gonna cure cancer. Doesn't mean that it's gonna be a good thing. It just says that what we see is not due to chance. And so we're gonna calculate a test statistic and a probability or a p-value. These things are different colors, hopefully you're not uh, colorblind, but the p-value and the test statistic are related, but they're not the same thing. We're gonna calculate a test statistic and we're gonna 
use that to calculate the probability of seeing that test statistic. So they're related, but they're not the same thing. So in stats, if we see a, pro a small probability level, less than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis and we say that our data doesn't support and the evidence is beyond a reasonable doubt. And for if it's greater than 5%, you can't reject it. It's just a queen on the river. It's just something, a fluke, and you don't have enough evidence to reject. Go ahead and type in the chat window, where did we get the 5% from? Who can guess? If I haven't put you to sleep yet with test statistics, we'll get into some questions and then we'll start calculating some test statistics and some t-values. What would your guess be here? A, B, C, or D? Uh, the 5%, Google said so. B, StatCrunch found it to be best. C, it's known the chance occurs, 5%. Or D, we just decided to live with 5%. Where did we get the 5% from? Oh, we're getting some C's, some D's. Those who said C, that they know how much chance it occurs that much. Vegas is opening, let's go. But really, we, boom, we just decided to live with 5%. Welcome to stats. The 5% is really made up. Some people think that Fisher, who is a leading statistician, he started publishing these data tables and he left 5% of his data off the next page. And people thought, oh, Fisher thinks that Chance is 5%. And some people think that's how it started. Others think we just decided 5%. Some people pick 1%. Um, if you know how much chance occurs, you will definitely will be going to Vegas together, making some money when it opens. Um, but really, we just decided to live with 5%. So we made up that value. The type 2 risk, that's the probability of committing this type 2 error, a false negative, is called beta. So the power of a test is the likelihood of rejecting the null hypothesis when it's really false. That's a correct decision, a good conviction of a criminal. That is the power of the test, and that's one minus beta. And unlike making up where we can move our 5% on the significance, it's harder to control the type two error, and the easiest way is to increase power. Uh, and increased power means increasing sample size, just getting more, more study subjects into your study and you'll have a better chance of not committing that, that type two error. So it's a little fuzzier for the type two error. But the type one is just the significance. So we're looking at the critical regions and we decide to accept or reject the null hypothesis looking at the distribution. So we started with this theoretical distribution and we then started looking at the distribution, calculate a test statistic, compare it to 5% or to a tabled value, and then we make our decision. So if we consider the one sample t-test, so one sample is like you have a blood pressure of a group or IQ, you compare it to a known number, that's a one sample t-test. You have one group of numbers you're comparing to a population value. That tests the null hypothesis that the population mean is a specific value. You test it against a value. Where do the t-tests come from? Well, you can impress your friends again. Now you know where the 5% was made up. Now you know the central limit theorem, um, 5%. This is the t-test, and guess where it came from? It came from beer. Who can be the first one to type in? The, an the answers are beer or water. What did people drink in the turn of the century? Did they, in England, in London, did they drink a lot of beer or did they drink a lot of water? Yeah, people, <laughs> people are still awake. Beer, good answer. And why? Well, if you're a nursing or my uh, health science people out there, my healthcare people know, that people drank beer at the turn of the century because the water was terrible, right? It was, it was full of all kinds of organisms and we didn't really have a safe water supply. So people drank water, beer has a lot of water in it. So people drink a lot of beer, good answer. As we go through um, that kind of argument, what we ended up sampling was somebody called, the original t-test was made by William Seeley Gossett and he worked for Guinness. So there's my Guinness picture of the dark beer. And Guinness was a very popular British beer, and Guinness was making a lot of money. And how he made his money on his beer was he had a great formula, which he kept secret. And Gossip came along. Gossip worked for Guinness and was a great statistician. And so what happened with, in England was the health department, public health said, hey, you can't just be giving everybody beer. I know we've got a water problem, but you've, we've got to test the beer. We can't just have you giving everybody beer. I mean, the water's bad enough. So they said, we're gonna to have to tap every keg and taste all the beer. 
Well, as you can imagine, Guinness was, he was not happy. He's like, no, we're not wasting beer. We're not gonna open every keg for the medical department to sample. He went back to his employees and said, hey, you're all people like me, biochemists, physiologists, and statisticians. You guys, I pay you a lot of money, figure this out. Somebody come up with a way that I don't have to tap every keg of beer. So Gossip came up with an idea of sampling and he came up with the tea distribution. And he said, we don't have to sample every keg. We can use this tea distribution and just sample a few of them and look at the averages and the sample averages of the sample to sample, make this equation, and we can now sample the beer. And this became known as the T-test. Type in yes or no for this one. Do you think that once this was done, yes, do you think Guinness allowed Gossett to publish his work or no, no publishing when he came up with the T-test? This way of sampling and theoretical distribution. Yeah, no, he would not, Guinness would not let the secret out. So what Gossett did, it's not called the Gossett test. He published it under the name, the student's test. And over the years, people stopped writing students and it just became the T-test. So Guinness was mad, but Gossett got his stuff out there. He called it the, uh, the student's test or the T-test. So there you go. Now you know the beer story. So this is what it looks like. So if we do one, let's get our little map out. Let me get my scrap paper ready. So it looks like this. T distribution. So looking at chapter five, you can calculate a value for T and that's on page 100. So let me flip over to that. We can find that formula for T and there it is. So it's the average right, minus the population value divided by the standard error of the mean, and that formula we just had before. So that's our test. So the standard error of the mean, remember, is just the, the standard deviation divided by n. So if we calculate the t, t equals the sample mean, and here this is probably pulse rate data, our mean is 73, our population mean, so the general population is 75, a little bit higher. Our standard deviation is 15. There's our alpha, our significance that we made up. Uh, our, we took 100 people, there's our n. And these, this is our null hypothesis. So if nothing's going on, then our sample average, our population average, it should be equal to 75. And if it's not true, it's not equal to 75. So this is the test we're gonna do. And again, this is our population value we're testing. So somewhere across the nation, there's an average of 75 and we're comparing it to our sample population of 73. So T is equal to the sample mean. So it's gonna be our uh, 73 minus the population average for the population mean of 75 divided by the standard error of the mean. So we're going to calculate a test statistic. Let me hold it up to the camera. The standard error of the mean, right, that's going to be our standard deviation divided by the square root of n, our population number. So we can get our calculator out. Standard deviation is 15 divided by the square root of 100. Well, I could probably do that in our heads, right? 15 divided by square root of 100 is 10. 15 divided by 10 is 1.5, right? So we get our T, 73 minus 75 is negative two divided by 1.5. So all we're doing is calculating our test statistic. So negative two divided by 1.5 is negative, like handy dandy TI 30X calculator, and we get negative 1.33. Wasn't that fun? So we'll do that, then we'll try to get the software to kick in and do it. So we can calculate this test certificate, and we have to decide well, is it significant or not significant? Right? So there's our calculation. So I just printed it out for you. So that's what I got from my. I can do math, I'm so happy we can do that. Okay, so then we take that number 
and we compare it and we take the absolute value because we don't know which side of that t-curve we're on. So this is our samples below the mean, so we have a negative test statistic. We take the absolute value and compare it to a critical value. Question is A, B, C, D, or E, where do we get that critical value from that we compare the test statistic to? A, Google it, B, guess, C, use stat crunch, D, in the chart of the t-distribution, or E, I have no idea. Yeah, you guys are getting this one. Yeah, so this one is D. We go to the t-distribution. And that's in the back on page 412 of the textbook. And so you can go all the way there. Or what I've done is in the course shell, I've given you these tables. If you go to course resources, you'll find it there and put it into a Word doc for everybody. So if you go to course resources, shared documents, most used tables, because watching me flip through the book is probably not what you want to do, or flipping, watching me flip through the back of the PDF. So if you open up that Word document, this is the table. Polite has put together a nice little cheat sheet for us. I don't know if it's a cheat sheet or a guide about the, the different types of tests. So I use this a lot because even if I'm doing an analysis, I always want to check that I'm right. Here's the one sample that's we're working on. Soon we'll do the two sample and we'll do ANOVA. So if you scroll down, these are the non-parametrics. We're going to do those next week, but you can't wait for that. And here's our page 412. So here's our table. And so this is, you take the theoretical distribution. This is the 5%, the blue area, that's showing you the critical value. So here's our N, and our N's 100. So we go down to the bottom, and it ends between 60 and 120. So we have about, yeah, 60 is about 2.0. It's between 2.0 and 1.98. Our absolute value is 1.33. It's not greater than 2, and therefore not significant. So our pulse rate is lower than the average, but there's no significant difference. It's all due to chance for this one. StatCrunch can do it too, because you know math isn't that much fun, right? Or you want to figure out how to do it with the software. So if we go to stat crunch, open our table, we can do it with the summary feature. So this is how we're going to do some of the assignment data as well. You can do it by hand if you want for the assignment, but hey, get the software to do it. So we'll click on the stat tab. So last week we worked on the summary stats and the tables. We're working our way down. Skip the Z stats. We're not going to work on that one. T stats, one sample. And we don't have the data, right, where we have all the subjects. We're going to click with summary. And then you can just put the values in. Sample mean was 73. Standard deviation was 15. Sample size is 100. And here the software is not smart. You have to, by default, it doesn't know what our population value is, our mu, right? We have to put that in. So if nothing's going on, it's not equal to zero. We have to put in the 73. So if I could raise a red flag or jump around like a TikTok video, this is, when you watch this back, you have to put in the number here for the one sample t-test. Okay, so for one sample t-test, you are smart, the software is stupid, you can pop that in there. So you click compute, and boy, I hope it gets the same answer. Do, do, do. Of course, I put the wrong one in, didn't I? After all that fanfare. The sample mean was 75. Compute. Ta-da! It got the same answer that we got from calculating it by hand. Now look what it did. It calculated the probability value and notice that it's about 18.5%, almost 19%. That means that 18.55% of the time, we would see this value of test statistic or greater in our data set. 99 degrees of freedom, n minus one. It calculated the standard error. We got the same answer, right? 1.5. Okay, so it's doing all the work. Hey, it popped out our null and alternative hypothesis, right? Mu, mu is equal to 75, mu is not equal to 75. That's our 
null and alternative hypothesis for a t-test. So the software is doing all the work for us. So again, when we reject it, the results are significant. So here we didn't reject because we didn't have enough evidence. And so if the null hypothesis is retained, if the p-value is greater than 0.05, the results are non-significant. So we compare the p-value to 0.05, and we compare the test statistic to the back of the book, to the table. A non-significant result is an outcome that it could have been obtained as a result of chance more than five out of 100 times, which we made up. So 5% or we compare it to the table. And then significance, and again, significance is just telling us that it, the probability does not merely reflect the chance. It's just not a queen in the river. It's something that's happening in the data. It doesn't mean it's important, clinically relevant, or meaningful, okay? The significance just means that what we see in the data set is not due to chance. So typically we always do a two-tailed test because we're looking at the theoretical curve and we don't know if, for example, with our pulse rate, if they're gonna have a higher pulse rate or a lower pulse rate. We give a drug to lower cholesterol, eh, it may higher, make the cholesterol higher, right? Or make it lower, we don't know. So typically we do a two-tailed test that's why in our little uh, table, it's always looking at the two level, two tail test of 5%. That's the one we're looking at. The only times you can use a one-sided test, so if you go back to StatCrunch, right, and you try to put something else in here, typically we don't use these greater than or equal than because we don't know which side of the curve we're on. And Taylor's asking, uh, is Simon explaining why we have accepted rejected the hypothesis? Should we mention the t-stat or the p-value? Yes. So when you're explaining in your assignment whether you accepted or rejected, you say, I, for this one, I rejected, or sorry, I accepted the null hypothesis because the p-value is above 5%, it's above 0.05, and the absolute value of the test statistic is less than the critical value in the table. So yes, we put those in for the assignment. And I'll be repeating those. I'll be like a broken record by the end of the night. So we will look at those. And when you're assignment, you want to put those in as well. So we always look at both sides of the table. And we do a directional one only when we have maybe some real evidence that, that it's going to lower cholesterol or increase the value, would we use that? So typically, we use a two-sided test, not a one-sided test. So again, two-tailed tests are the norm. A lot of assumptions, here we go, we're gonna hear a lot of assumptions in this course, that's statistics, so nobody trusts it. We're assuming that we have a random sample, right? That we randomly sample the people in the pulse rate, randomly sample people for who they're gonna vote for in an election. We randomly sample IQ. So that's an assumption we make. That's often ignored. But um, if we can get a good size sample, we can kind of make that random sampling true. So a parametric test is one, again, that involves an estimate population parameter. So we're looking at the average. Again, interval ratio data. We're not going to do uh, nominal level data for this type of test. And we're always going to use these ratio or interval, as I said. So it's got to be numbers, quantitative data that we can work with for these types of t-tests. And then again, we'll talk non-parametric next week. That's where we're not going to do population parameter. We're going to do counts because we just have for nominal level or ordinal variables, we just have categories and counts, right, and rankings. So we'll go over some of those next week. Okay, degrees of freedom. We could spend another hour on the degrees of freedom if we were in a math class, but we're not going to because we probably would go insane. But for one sample t-test, degrees of freedom is n minus one. I will give you the two minute explanation of degrees of freedom as opposed to the one hour. That's okay with everybody. And get back to my paint program. Should I save that now? We we're over the central limit theorem. If I give you numbers, so we're gonna to try to explain this thing called degrees of freedom. Let's say I give you five numbers. Let's do five numbers. Eight, five, nine, get your calculators handy eight, and then I'm mysterious, and I don't tell you what the fifth number is, but I tell you that the average is 7.2. So let's make this a little x. And the question is, what is x? 
So we know the average. So the average is all five numbers, add them up, divide them by five. So eight plus five plus nine plus eight is 30, right? If you can see my DXI 30X. So we know that 30, and if we add an X, right? So 30 plus that number divided by five, which is N, is gonna equal our average, right? Which is 7.2. Oh no, algebra. 30 plus X divided by five equals 7.2. Oh gosh, how do we solve for X? Cross products of a proportion are true, right? That's why I suffered through algebra in ninth grade, or maybe it was 10th grade. So cross products of the proportion are true. So to get there, 30 plus X divided by five, you have to take the five times 7.2 is 36 equals 7.2 over one, so that equals 30 plus X. So now what is X? <laughs> you could do the easy part, right? So five times 7.2, 36 equals 30 plus X, cross proportions of a product are two. So we take 30 minus 30 minus 30 and X is six. Yeah, six. So you can just add it up, right? So nine, uh, six plus eight plus nine plus five plus eight, is our 36 divided by five is 7.2. N minus one. So, and mathematically, that's what we have to do. What if I took away the eight? If I took away two numbers, could you ca possibly calculate and find the two missing numbers? Could you do N minus two here? No, because we only can do one, right? Yeah, Kristen's got it. No, because how, how we couldn't find, I don't know, a quadratic equation, you couldn't solve it because you can only take away one number. So it's really a definition of how the third would be free to vary around the, the variables. So for a one sample t-test, it's n minus one. Now, if we were in a math class, the mathematicians, their heads would be exploding because this is not really the true explanation of degrees of freedom, but it's close enough for this class. It's n minus one is the, how many parameters we can factor around to get at numbers that are missing. So that's basically our n minus one. When we do a two sample t-test, it's n minus two. When we do an ANOVA and we're looking at variations, we're gonna have n minus whatever ones we're doing the math on. So really it's the components that are free to vary around the parameter. And for this class, we'll leave it at that. So that was a little longer than three minutes, but there's your degrees of freedom explanation for the day. And luckily the software actually will tell us the degrees of freedom. But for one sample t-test, it's n minus one. So again, for manual computations, when we're doing it by hand and we're calculating the test statistic, we're going to specify our significance level. We're gonna do a one or two tailed test. We're gonna probably do a two tailed test because we don't know if it's gonna be above or below the mean. Calculate the degrees of freedom, N minus one for one sample test. Compare that to the table in the back and then decide to accept or reject. For the computer, we're gonna select the test statistic like we did, specify the level significance, and do one's tail versus two tail, but in the software, we're gonna keep it right there for both, because we don't know if it's above or below the mean. Then we're gonna get the computer to do the calculation, and it'll calculate the actual probability value. So again, that probability is 18.5, times out of 100, we will see this test statistic or greater in our data set. So here's another quick one. Let's look at, I uh, put this in shared documents for you. If you go to Statistics for Dummies, they've got free uh, data sets. And also StatCrunch has a lot of data sets you can, you can play with. But this one is salaries. If we look at salaries in a given area, and if you go to course resources, I put the data set here as well. So here's the salaries. And if you download that, it's an Excel file. We've got a bunch of salaries. And I think there's like 400 or something here. Yeah, like 473 total. So we went knocking on doors, asked people about their salary. 
So let's run a one sample t-test given that the national salary average in this region of the country is, is 32,000. So we'll do a one sample t-test. We're gonna get um, salary average. I think I did this one on YouTube. So what's our null hypothesis gonna be for this one? If nothing's going on, A, B, C, or D. A, the salaries of the region are below the national average, B, they're above, C, they're equal to the national average, or D, they're not equal to. For a one sample t-test, what's our null hypothesis going to be? We got some C's, we got some D's. So if nothing's going on, it's going to be equal to the national average. Okay. And if you look back at the textbook, if you get lost, there's another example of a one sample t-test. So if nothing's going on, our salary level should be equal to the national average. That's on page 101. So here's an example where she does compares the sample average to five. So our null hypothesis, nothing going on, it should be equal to, and we're gonna do a test to see how far away it is to see if that's by chance, once it gets away from that sample average. So again, it's gonna be that our, in our region are equal to the national average. So we can do this one in StatCrunch, we can open up our data. So I'll go back to StatCrunch, I'll get rid of this one, I'll go to my data tab, we can load this one in. So again, we can do summary data like we did for the last one, or we can get the all the data. And I think I've got it sitting on my desktop here, salaries. And again, you can download this one. I'll drag it over, click upload, and it'll bring that Excel file in there. So for one sample, we're gonna click the stat tab, go to our T stats, one sample, and now we're gonna pick with, with data because we've got all the data in our set, right? So we click with data because we've got it all in our table. Get rid of that pink, click that clear. So each subject is a line and we gotta select the salary. The ID number is probably not that interesting to analyze. We're gonna hit this one and our hypothesis, what number do we put in here? We can't leave it at zero. It's zero by default because the computer doesn't know what we're supposed to put in there for this one. What value do we put in for our null hypothesis? Yeah, the national average, so 32,000. You're smart, the software is stupid. 32,000 goes in there. We'll leave this alone because we don't know if the people are rich or poor, right? We're gonna find out. And we click compute and it, it spits out our Null and alternative hypotheses. So we can put those in there. There's our sample mean, 34,419. It's above the average, it's a little rich, richy rich here. 0.002, so 0.2% of the time we would see this level of salary or higher. So type in for this one, yes or no. Yes, significant, no, not significant result with 0.2% p-value. But we're getting a lot of no's, not significant. So this p-value is really low, right? So this one we compare to 0.05, or we can look at the test statistic. So once we get this one in, we'll figure this one out. So this one actually is significant. Why? Because our p-value is below 0.05, right? It's 0 0.002. The other is we look at the test statistic, 3.08. So our n here, our degrees of freedom are 473, n minus one. Let's look at the table. Who can be the first to type in? What's our critical value with the degrees of freedom at 473? What's the critical value from the table that we're gonna compare the test statistic to? Again, here's the blue area. Here's degrees of freedom, 473. Yeah, 1.98 or 1.96, so we're past this one. And notice that our test statistic is greater than the tabled value, again, showing it's significant. That drives the p-value. So the p-value goes lower as the test statistic gets higher. So it's greater than our 1.98 or 1.96, so it's a significant result. We've got a rich group here, right? They're, they're 34,000, they're above the mean in this one. We'll do some more examples. So, We've got this one. We can also go back and do the confidence interval. We click edit. Now notice if I, just before I leave here, if I leave this at zero and I click compute, it's gonna get ugly. So notice that 
the p-value is really low, which is significant, but look how large the test statistic became, becomes. So 43 is really unusual. Our test statistics usually are like two or one, right? They can get as high as like three or four, but 43, is, that tells us that this really is not right. So you want to make sure you're putting in, especially for the one sample t-test, put in that right number, because again, you're smart. And what happens when the degrees of freedom are not on the table? Well, notice that as I go from 60 to 120, that's only two one hundredths of a difference. So when you're comparing the test statistic, you're probably okay. As long as you're getting, if it's past 120, it's just gonna be 1.96. You can go to Google and Google will print out every value of T for you based upon the degrees of freedom, but we wanted to save paper. So when they made the textbook, they just put it on one page. But again, very, very, uh, you know, there's only two one hundredths of a difference between that. So once you get above this, then you use this value, 1.96. Okay, by hand, eh, we did that one already. But again, the T value, let's just do one, is going to be the mean. We've got the mean, 34,419.57 minus the average, 32,000 divided by the standard error of the mean. Well, we'll cheat, it calculated it for us. That's just gonna be the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So divided by 784.3. So we can calculate that T by hand. So that's gonna be 34,000. So it's 2,000, 2,419, right? 0.57 divided by 784.3. And I get 3.085. So whether you have the software, oh, pretty good. So we have the same value doing it by hand. It's just doing all of the hard work for us. 3.084959, that's pretty cool. And again, I can reduce this if I go display position at four, because I, I have issues. Refresh. There we go. So you can make your table a little more manageable. Again, like we did last week, just by doing those precision significant figures to four. So we can do it by hand and we're good to go. So for the assignment, you're gonna do this fellow's research group data, mental health data, and you're comparing the mental health score. So let's look, pull that data out and we'll do one with the cognition score. We'll just do one more. So I'm gonna go to data, load from file, and I think I've got that data handy. There it is, fellows mental health data. And again, if you open that fellows file data from the assignment area, I've got the coding key down here. So that this uh, GPCOG is a general practitioner assessment of cognition, so it's a cognition score. And then we've got our mental health score like we did last week, so that's in this data set. So for the assignment, you're going to work on the mental health score, which is this column. So let's do, let's analyze this column as an example. Let's look at the cognition score. So in the cognition score, the national average is nine. And our null hypothesis for this one's going to be that it should be equal to nine, right? We can get the software to do that one. And also, oh, we'll do the 95% confidence intervals example for this one too. So we click the stat tab, we go to T stats, one sample, and again with data, because we've got the data. So you'll do your assignment, the mental health, but we're gonna do the cognition score as an example. And remember, you gotta put this in, so don't leave it at zero. Here it's nine, we're gonna compare this to nine. We'll come back and do the confidence intervals in just a bit. Click compute. There's, it spits out our null and alternative hypothesis for us. There's a cognition score. The means 9.74, standard error, n minus one. There's the T stat. Here's your chance to shine. Yes, significant, no, not significant with a p-value of 0 0.02. 2.2% of the time we see this value of test statistic or higher. Yes, significant, no, not significant with a p-value of 0.02. Okay, better.
<laughs> you got that one. Yes, because we compare this one to 0 0.05. Below 0 0.05, the test statistic gets larger. This gets smaller. Less chance, less seeing this of chance. So that 5% we made up, this one's significant. We will reject the null hypothesis. There's something going on with this group that their cognition scores are higher than the national average, and this is significant. And then you know what's coming next? We look at the score at 149 degrees of freedom. What's our critical value we compare the test statistic to? 140, we're back to our one point, yeah, 1.96, Kristen's got it. 1.96, 1.98. You can see that our value, our absolute value is greater than that. Again, telling us we have a significant result. One sample test. So now that we know the one sample, we're going to do the two sample in the ANOVA, and then we're done for the night. Similar types of tests we're going to go over. The confidence intervals. So again, that's the 95%. If we go back and click edit, we can do the confidence intervals. It's defaulted at 95%, but you can switch this to get the 99% if you want. Click compute. We've got our cognition score selected. There's our upper and lower limit. So what does this mean? There's our sample mean, and it did all the calculations for us. So that's back to where we started, right, with chapter five. If we go back now to that page, it makes more sense now, right? We go back to 90, page 92. There's our confidence intervals, right? It's the x, the average x bar, right? Plus or minus the t value times the standard error of the mean. So that means if we keep sampling, we go back and we sample the cognition scores. 95% of the time, they'll fall between 9.1 and 10.3. And again, we can calculate those by hand. So the so it's equal to the confidence intervals are equal to the average plus or minus t times the standard error of the mean. So here our value we said was 1.98. So we're at 143. Yeah, we're past 120. So I would use 1.96. It's probably 1.97 somewhere in there. So there's our value of t. Our average is 9.74. Standard error of the mean, 0.32, right? So it's the average, our 9.74, plus or minus 1.96 times 0.32, 1.96 times 0 0.32, 0.6272. So we get the confidence interval 10.37, 9.74 minus, 0.6272, gosh, I hope this is right, 9.11, isn't math fun? 9.107, 9.11, Ah, not bad. So again, the software is just doing all of the math for us. The confidence interval is 9.74 plus or minus the average, I'm sorry, the average is 9.74 plus or minus T times the standard error of the mean. Exciting. That's as exciting as it gets, and it's all because of beer. Who would have thought? Okay, so we got our confidence intervals. What do they mean? If we keep sampling, we sample another 100 cognition scores, another 100 patients, subjects. We're going to get a cognition score 95% out of 100 between 9.1 and 10.37. Again, all based on our average. That's as hard as one sample t-test get. So we can do the same logic for two sample t-tests. So one sample, one group, two sample, two groups. We use this one a lot when we compare a control experimental group, right? We put subjects in two groups. We're going to use a two sample t-test. Again, uh, independent variable is nominal level. So it'll be something like um, subjects in a group, a control or experimental group. And the dependent variable is going to be interval ratio, a number just like our one sample t-test. So experimental versus control, gender differences, men versus women, children with or without cystic fibrosis is a two sample t-test. Again, the dependent variable is going to be interval ratio, like we've been working with these numbers tonight, something that we can compute a mean with. And we're going to compare those values. So the null hypothesis for a two sample test is that the means are the same, right? So the independent variable and dependent variable are not related. So 
the software treats it as uh, mu1 equals mu2. The two averages should be the same. And then the alternative is that they're not the same. And again, the software will analyze this for us as well. Again, we're going to test the null hypothesis by calculating the test statistic, computing the value, right, getting the p-value, and also comparing it to the table, the theoretical distribution. And it's going to be the sampling distribution of the difference between the two means. So using this t-test, we assume, again, uh, random sampling, the outcome variables normally distributed. How do we get around that? Sample, sample, right? Central limit theorem. And that the population variances are equal. It's something called an assumption of homogeneity of the variance. And that kind of means that the sample within the group, it doesn't, the average doesn't change that much. There's just something not strange about the groups that we picked as far as their numbers go. Again, assumptions that uh, we need sample sizes should be large for using a t-test and that the sizes in the groups are similar. And the similar means about one and a half times the number of one group and the other group for a t-test. Although there's ways we can figure, we can moderate those as well. So there's different types of t-tests. So the one sample t-test is pretty easy, but with the two sample t-tests, you can have an independent test or a dependent test because you can use the same groups twice, right? Called a paired test. So say you're given a treatment, like I do my uh, study with veterans, I don't want to not have the veterans ride the horse. So I do a dependent test. I test them before they're riding and then after they're riding, but it's the same people. That's a dependent test, same people. Or an independent test, I would have some people, some veterans read the phone book and another group, uh, that would be the control group, the other group would ride the horse, right? So th that's an independent uh, test. And in between those, with the independent groups, you can use a pooled, what's called a pooled variance formula or separate variance, depending upon um, how the, the data and the groups look. The pooled usually is when you have the same sample size if you have different sample sizes, you'd use a separate variance formula. It just modulates the t-test a little bit. But the biggest difference is between the independent and dependent type of test. So if you go back to the, the little cheat sheet in the top, there's different types of tests. So you can look at uh, two different groups in a pair test, or it could be an independent test, depending upon what groups that you have. So again, the independent test the groups are different. So genders are different, teenagers, adults, treatment groups, control groups, those are all independent tests. They're not the same people and they're not related in any way. Pooled variance is just a formula that you use typically when the groups are, group numbers are equal or that they're, uh, the, the way the groups are set up, their variations are not that great. And with a two sample test, it's uh, N minus two. So typically you'll use the pooled variance when you have equal groups equal numbers in your groups. You can do another test for this. SPSSS does it automatically. In StatsCrunch, you have to decide. And as a general rule, as I said, we'll use that pooled variance when we have equal groups, equal ends in the groups. And if they're slightly different, you can use the separate variance formula. So it's basically we select that when we do the software. And again, the dependent test is, a, is just a paired test. So those are groups that are related, like they're getting the same treatment pre or post, like my veterans, if I want to just test them before they ride and after they ride, those are the same people. That's a dependent test. Things that are related, husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, twins, that would be a dependent type test, a pair test. And again, it's one we would select when we do our t-test. So there's the paired test, there's our two sample test, and when we do the two sample, we would select that pooled variances if we need to. So I'll show you that in just a bit. So there's a dependent independent. So let's look at one where we have a behavioral therapy with patients with Alzheimer's. This is a small study, 12 patients. And can we run a two sample test on this data set? So I can go back to StatCrunch. Let me open up a new sheet here. So we can have them in different columns, call it behavioral therapy and a medication group. And this is small number, so we can just pop these in. These are their scores on a cognitive function score. 
So again, we can type data in into separate groups or we can download it from a file. I think I got these in your right. So the first is what's our null hypothesis? So A, B, or C, if nothing's going on, the score should are equal, that's A, not equal is B, C is higher than the score of the medication group, D is lower the score than the medication group. What's our null hypothesis for a two sample t-test? Nothing's going on, the function score of each group should be what? Danielle's got it, uh, equal, right? So it's A. So again, nothing going on, the groups, the averages should be equal. So that's what we're gonna test. We click on the stat tab, we'll go to the two sample test. Uh, this one's not paired because they're not the same subjects because they either got the medication or the therapy. And we click with, with data because we've got the data. Then we put in our columns. So there's sample one, sample two. And by default, the pooled variance is, is off. But here we'll click it back on because our ends are equal. So likely we can just use the pooled variances formula. So for this one, I would click it on. By default, it's clicked off because maybe a lot of groups we look at don't have the same ends or their variances are not exactly equal. It just modulates the T statistic a little bit for uh, the result. And here is our hypothesis. Now here, the software is smart, right? If the mu's are equal, then mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. So there's another algebra for you. This one by default, you can leave alone. The software is fine there. We have to change this for the one sample. For the two sample, we don't. Click compute, we get our answer. Again, there's our hypotheses typed out for us. We're gonna do the pooled variances because we've got equal numbers of n's here. We can likely use the pooled variances formula. N minus two, degrees of freedom of 10. So we've got 12 subjects, n minus two is 10. There's our T stat. Here we go, yes, significant, no, not significant with a P value of 8%. Yes, significant, no, not significant. People are still awake, they're typing no. And that's correct, right? Because this is above 0.05. So it's just a queen on the river. It's just some kind of value. Here's our 1.93, our 10 degrees of freedom. We go back to the back of the book, to our chart, 10 degrees of freedom. What's our critical value at 10 degrees of freedom that we compare the test statistic to? Yeah, Kristen's ahead of me. 2.23, right. So 2.23, 10 degrees of freedom, n minus two, 12 minus two, there's our 5%. Notice our test statistic is less than the critical value, further telling us it's not significant. The p-value goes up above 5% to 8%, not significant. Sometimes though, if they're split this way, we're good to go. StatCrunch, when you do the test, can only compare two groups and two columns. So if you wanna look at the means of two groups in one column, like if we have several data sets where they would be in one column, you have to split the data by the nominal level variable and then, one, then get them into two columns. So I'll do an example of that in just a minute. But when you've got them in one column, you have to split them. So Daniel's asking, you probably answered, but p-value is always compared to 0.05 to determine significance. Yes, that value we just made up, unless you're told something else. So sometimes we look at 0.01, sometimes 0.1. So um, whatever value we put in, but typically it's 0.05. If it's above 0.05, above 5%, it's not significant. Below 0.05, it's significant. Two sample tests by hand? Yeah, let's do that. Ooh, so this is the formula for a two sample t-test. You have to take the averages of group one. Oh gosh, find the SD squared. So there's the variance, right? There's the ends and do this formula, which we could put into Excel. I think a student once that liked Excel put this into Excel for me and you can calculate the test statistic. So this is for the textbook from chapter six of experimental and control group pulse rates in uh, beats per minute. I don't want to do that by hand, but we can check it using the summary feature in StatCrunch. So if we go back to StatCrunch, we can just click the Stat tab, go to our T-Stats, two sample, and instead of data, because we don't have the data here, we don't, uh, I guess we could type it in. 
but we can just click on the with summary. And just like we did for the one sample, we can get the software to calculate it for us. The only caveat is we have, this is variance SD squared, right? So we have to put in the standard deviation. So we just got to take the square root to put in here. So the sample mean is 95 for group one. The deviation is 154.46. So this is the variance she listed here. That's the variances in the formula, but to put it in a stack crunch, we need the standard deviation. So we've got to take the square root. 154.46, hit the square root key, 12.43, sample size is 10, 10. Sample mean of this group is 105. Gosh, I hope we get the right answer. Standard deviation, we have, this is the variance, so we have to take the square root. Right, we learned that last week. Six, seven, square root, 11.77. Hypothesis, we leave alone. We can click the pool variances on because we got this identical sample size. This we leave because the, the group should be means should be equal if nothing's going on. Click compute and look at that. Negative 1.85. So again, we can get the software to calculate that for us. We just got to make sure we put in the standard deviation or we can do that by hand or not. So there's sample size. There's also the consideration of power for the test. Like I said, for the power, you can increase it by just increasing your N. Again, the power is the inverse of the beta, the risk of a type two error. And the software can analyze power for us as well, or we can look it up in the back of the book in a table. So the power analysis we're looking at to see how many ends we have. And the easiest way to get that going in power analysis is to increase our sample size, also to look at our population effect size. And Britain's Bree's asking, so the standard deviation to be squared in this case, um, for that one, it was the variance is the square of the standard deviation. Yeah, so the calculation for the T for a two sample test is the variance. So to put it back in here, we've got to put in the standard deviation. So we take the square root. So in our book, we've got uh, the power size. This is the D, which is the effect. So this is like if you're looking for a 5% effect or a 25% effect, the larger effect you have, the uh, less ends you need depending upon the power. And typically we wanna keep our power at about 80%. So this is, again, the likelihood of rejecting the null hypothesis when it's really false. So this is the good conviction, the power of the test. And we usually wanna keep that at 80% with the 5% for our alpha that we made up. These would be the ends we would need. So the power and ends you can get from the table in the back of the book. And they also will, um, the software can calculate the power for you as well. So getting back to, so we did a two sample t-test. We didn't do one by hand. We just checked it in the summary for by hand. Let's do one where we've got a two sample t-test in the assignment. You're again, looking at this mental health data and you're looking at the mental health scores. So let's look at the cognitive scores like we did for the one sample. I think I've got that data open. Here it is, the fellows data. So again, this is for the assignment. You're gonna look at mental health, but let's look at cognitive scores. So we did a one sample test. Let's do a two sample t-test and let's look at marital status, married versus divorce. So we've got single, never married, right? Single, divorced and married. We've got three groups here. So for a two sample test, using this one, we go to the stat tab t-test two sample with data. See, we can only select the cognitive score and that's all we can select. So we have to get it back to looking like this one. And the only way to do that is remember, we have to split the data. So to do that, we go to the data tab. And again, this is because the software won't be able to do this. We have to tell it what to do. So we go to the data tab arrange and split, just like the slide says here. 
So we're going to select the column of our cognitive score, and we're going to split it by marital status. So that'll give us the column so we can look at a two sample t-test. Click compute and the software will do that for us. So there's our cognitive score, single, married, divorced. If I look at the numbers, oh, the single, married, divorced are the same, so we could probably use that pooled variance. And we're not looking at the single. So now I can go married versus divorced. Well, now we'll click our stat tab, T stats, two sample with data. And now we can select our columns. So there's the divorced, and the other one will be the married. We can click those pooled variances because they're the same ends. So we can probably get away with that. Again, we can leave that there because if nothing's going on, the means of the group should be equal, right? We click compute for the cognitive score. So the cognitive score, based upon this data set, with a p-value, we would see this test statistic 19% of the time. Yes, significant, no, not significant, with a p-value of 0.19 or 19.3%. Taylor says no, Courtney says no. Yeah, this one is not significant, right? Because we, yeah, Jacqueline got it, okay. Because it's above 0.05. There's our test statistic. It's negative, so we look at the absolute value. It spit out our null and alternative hypothesis for us. Da, da, da. Degrees of freedom, 86. 86 degrees of freedom. Past 60, so about 1.98. Again, the absolute value, 1.31 is not greater than our test statistic, so not significant. Probably makes sense, right? I guess being divorced or married doesn't influence your cognition. At least I would hope not, but you never know. So if the data is already split, we're fine. If not, we're going to have to split the data using the uh, data tab and the arranged split data. One sample, two sample, three sample is an ANOVA. So with this test, it's often abbreviated ANOVA. This is the last one we'll do tonight. Analysis of variance. This looks at the means of three or more groups. But be careful with ANOVA, it's still two variables right? We're not going into just groups. We're not doing separate variables. So the biggest ones, so Sergio's asking, do we reject the null hypothesis p values over 0.05? No, we reject if it's, if it's less than 0.05. So below 5% is very rare. We reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative that something, something's going on. You're welcome. No problem. We'll do one more. You'll be pro by the end here. So ANOVA looks at three more. So we have one sample, two sample, three groups. We're going to use the ANOVA. And if you look at the chapter, it's a different distribution, just to make you crazy, looking at the groups. So if we go to chapter seven, we're going to get into the F statistic, looking at the groups. Again, two variables, but within that variable, we're looking at three or more groups. And there's the F statistic. It's always positive. It skews around one and goes out this way. So depending upon the um, number of groups, it kind of looks a little bit different. So there's the other distribution. Again, still two variables. It has its own distribution and table. And I put it on that cheat sheet for you. Here's the critical values of F at 0.05 significance. It has degrees of freedom between and degrees of freedom within, because it's going to look at the differences between the groups and within the groups. So again, the dependent variable is our all our qualitative variables, heart rate, self-esteem scores, cholesterol, but we're doing it within, within groups. And again, the independent variable is nominal. It's like ethnicity, uh, marriage, anything that has groups within it that's three or more is going to be an ANOVA. For the null hypothesis, it's that the group means are equal, right? So mu1 equals mu2 equals mu3, mu4, and so forth. And the alternative hypothesis is at least some of the group's means are not equal. Again, a lot of assumptions for ANOVA, random sampling, 
dependent variables normally distributed in the population. How do we get around that? Sample, 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 central limit theorem. Variances in the population are equal. Again, we're gonna do that Levine statistic and look at the variances within the groups. But if the numbers are equal, we can kind of get around that assumption as well. You're gonna get variations. So you're gonna have between group variation between the groups, right? And within the groups. So that's what the uh, F statistic looks at. It is literally the between the group variance divided by the within the group variance. So it could contrast the variance that we're seeing. Now, if nothing's going on, right, then this should, thing should be zero, right? There shouldn't be any variance going on. So really it's a way of looking at the effect of the independent variable and the sampling error, which we always have, divided by the sampling error. So we're looking at the effect of that independent variable. So again, if it has no group, this should be just the sampling error and it should be, uh, should be one. So they're often centered about one in the F distributions. In the simplest ANOVA, there's, there's a few of them that are different. So that's up in the cheat sheet up here as well the different types of tests. There's an analysis of variance. So there's our one sample, two sample. Again, the DV interval ratio. That's how you know you're using the right test. Analysis of variance, compare the means. So one way ANOVA is comparing the means. The repeated measures is when you have uh, repeated scores. So this is similar to the, um, the paired test, okay? So the one way ANOVA is looking at three or more independent groups, and it's comparing the scores from the group means and the overall grand mean. So it's adding up all of this stuff. So if you look at an example in the textbook, and we're not gonna do an ANOVA by hand, it looks like this. You have to take the three groups, find out the averages, compare the averages within the group to those of the grand mean, the overall groups, and then you get what's called sum of squares within, so that's the, the total of the squared deviations, which is why the S statistic is positive, right? Because we're squaring everything and the sum of squares between the total of each group mean from the grand mean. And you get this uh, F statistic. So again, you're looking at the mean squares within and comparing it to the mean squares between and calculating the, uh, the F statistic. So again, the same way, if the calculated F is greater than the tabled value, the result is statistically significant and we reject the null hypothesis. So that's the main one and we're gonna do, only do the one-way ANOVA in this course. Multi-factor ANOVA is one where you can have a situation where you have multiple independent variables. So we won't cover that too much in this course because I said we're only gonna do um, two variables in this course, but you can have a two-way ANOVA where you have two independent variables. And sometimes each one is called a factor. You can have repeated measures ANOVA. This is like a pair test. And this I actually do with my veterans. I measure them before, during, and after their interaction with the horse, with their heart rate variability. And so it's a repeated measures ANOVA. Again, three groups, because I'm measuring three times, but it's a pair test. So you take multiple times and different, or different time periods. And you can have different designs for that crossover. So you assign them to a treatment group in random order, or you can have pre post interventions with multiple post tests. So there's different ways you can design these repeated measures ANOVAs. So again, ANOVA tells us whether the null hypothesis is true. It does not pinpoint the means that are significant from each other. So you can measure before, during, after. All you know is when you run the test is that something of those three is different. You don't know which one it is. To figure out which group is causing the significance or non-significance, you have to do a post test, some other type of test to figure that out. Last one of the night. So if we look at, we'll do one by hand, you can type in the data and then we'll do one that's an example from the assignment. So happiness scores, let's see. I think I actually put this in the, in the course shell. In course resources, oh, it's right there. Happiness data. So I put it in the shared documents folder, data sets. There's the happiness data from an ANOVA. So this one is in all in one field. So let's bring that into StatCrunch. In the interest of time, I'll load this file in. So you don't have to watch me type all these happiness numbers in. 
And again, this one's in course resources if you want to practice with this later. So there's our two variables, our marriage status. So again, these married, single, divorced, these are three groups within one variable marriage status, right? This is not separate variables. Then I've got their score. That's the interval ratio variable. So that one's there. Are men, married men happier than single men or divorced men? So we go to our stat tab. Moving on down, here's ANOVA. And again, we're not going to do two-way in this class. We're going to focus mainly on the one-way ANOVA with one independent variable. And in this one, we're going to have, click on the second one. We've got values in a single column. If we had selected columns, like we did for our behavioral therapy, if we had them all in different columns, we'd stay up here. But here we've got the values in a single column. So we'll go here. Responses in our score, happiness score. Select the column of our marriage status. Click compute. And this time it doesn't need to sort the data. It does it automatically from one column. So there's our means. Here's your big test, p-value of 88.6%, 0.885. Yes, significant, no significant with an 88% probability. Good, no, you're getting it, right. Look how little small the S statistic is, 0.121. So we're gonna go, the first one is the between. So there's two groups between, and then there's 30 subjects. So there's our, um, within the groups itself. So when we go to the table, it has its own table. And at 5%, the rest are in the back of the book, the back of the textbook. But for the 5% level, the degrees of freedom between is two. And then within is our 30 number. So it's 27. N minus three, because we've got three groups. So we go to 27 and two. So our test statistic here we compare it to is 3.35. So again, it's our test statistic is much lower than our critical value of 3.35. So again, a not significant result. So again, this table is the between is this one here, the, the groups, so there's three groups, N minus one. And then the total is it's in the error column here at 27 because we've got 30 minus three groups is 27. So we do two by 27 on this table. So that's that one. And then the ANOVA, in the assignment, you're gonna use the fellows group data. The discussion board, you're gonna look at a one sample t-test. So let's pull that data in from the discussion thread. I think I've got it on my desktop here. So this is this week's discussion question one data where you guys are gonna do a one sample t-test, but let's use this data set for an ANOVA. Let me load that in there and look at drinking and optimism score. So for the discussion thread, you're gonna compare a population value to this score. And we can also do an ANOVA on drinking. We've got never three plus times once or twice. Click on the stat tab, ANOVA one way, because we've got one independent variable, their drinking status. And again, we click on the values in a single column. We're gonna look at that optimism score, the interval ratio value, and factor in their drinking. Click compute. So there's our three groups. Again, ANOVA's three groups. So we did one, two, three tonight. There's the mean optimism score. Here's our F statistic. There's our P value. Again, for this one, yes or no? Yes, significant, no, not significant with a P value of 14%. Does drinking affect your optimism? No. Probably everyone's learning this in quarantine. It doesn't really affect your optimism. It's not a good strategy. Nine, 13%. And again, our F statistic, if we go to our table, we look at the 5% table for the F statistic. Ooh, two, we've got three groups, so it's two. That's why this number is smaller up here. Two by 997, so we're all the way at the bottom. 
2.99. So again, 1.97 is less than the critical value. We're good to go. So the value we did, so the, again, this, this F statistic is taking in these mean squares values with the, um, between the groups and within the groups. So for example, if you just take that value, be, means the mean squares between, just take 215.54, divide that with the within one, which is 109.27, you get, if you can see my handy dandy calculator, 1.97. So that's all it's calculating for the F statistic. The mean squares um, within divided by, or between divided by the within gives you 1.97. And we get our test statistic. And we're done. So what did we do? We got all the way through one sample, two sample, right? And if we go back to the discussion thread, we've covered those tonight. So start with the discussion boards. People are already posting to those. So there's stuff there to compare with. You're going to look at that um, Excel file that we worked with tonight. Let's look at the assignment. I think we covered everything for the assignment. We did it. One sample, two sample, ANOVA. Again, this is recorded. If I went too fast, go through, make sure you can push the buttons that I did to do the ANOVAs. Make sure you're splitting the data if it's a two sample. But start with the start with the discussion threads. Okay, go through, practice the ones that we did. Make sure you can do the ANOVA, you can do the analyses, and you're all getting it. If it's below 0.05, low, below 5%, it's significant. We reject the null hypothesis. If it's above 0.05, it's just a queen in the river. It's just a chance effect where somebody won a poker hand they didn't really deserve to win. So next week we will start, we'll work on chi-square, we'll do the non-parametric and go from there. So again, you've got the discussion threads, start working on those, work on your assignment, and then you've got the quiz for this week.